You can turn with me in your Bible to the book of 2 Kings. We will start right here. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. You can grab that, and I know you'll be blessed. That's your, your gift. You can have that one. And uh, we, we are exhausted. We spent a week at Vacation Bible School. How many of you helped at Vacation Bible School? A sea of people, over 300 volunteers. Uh, 100 of them were youth. So that was fantastic. A lot of you showed up. And now we're going to camp. Uh, some have left this morning. The rest of us will leave tomorrow. I'm going to the Southern Baptist Convention uh, tonight. I'll be there to Wednesday. Then I'll go to camp. It was interesting. I, uh, just a, few, a week before that, I was at the Vatican. And now I'm going to the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, there's a difference. There's a big difference. One is top down to where they tell people what to believe and what to do. And, then at the, and now we, we go to tell the convention what we want done. And so we technically are not a denomination except for two days out of the year. That's when we as messengers go and say, we like this, we don't like that, let's do this, let's win the world by doing this. And then the executive committee makes sure that the seminaries and the agencies like the North American Mission Board, the International Mission Board, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, they all enact what you and I vote on. And so it's a complete different type of, of system because we are all free before the Lord, right? It's called the priesthood of the believers. We hear from God ourselves. We don't need someone else to do that for us, right? God has spoken to us through his word. And when we read his word and we look at it in the context, in its meaning, and we apply it to our lives, we are literally enacting what God wants us to do. And each one of us do this independently, and we do it together as the body of Christ. Amen? So I, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm, glad, uh, I'm glad to be a Baptist. If I wasn't a Baptist, you know what I'd be? Embarrassed. I'm just saying. I just, that's what I'd be. I'm just teasing, just teasing to my Presbyterian and Methodist brothers and sisters out there. I love you. We can have communion together. I love you. But uh, anyway, <laughs> God bless. Second, Second Kings. What we are going to do in Second Kings, we are going to look at proper postures to have proper postures to have in relationship to four areas. And I just want to read these two chapters together. It is good for the body of Christ, for the people of God, to read scriptures together. We see this in the Old Testament and the New Testament. There was one time where they just read through the whole law. They stood up and they read through the whole law. And uh, we're not going to do that this morning uh, or this, it'd take a day at least. But we are going to read two chapters together. Amen? Chapter 1 2 Kings, verse 1. After the death of Ahab, yay, sorry. (laughs) Moab rebelled, Ahab was a really bad guy and he did bad things. Moab rebelled against Israel. Ahaziah Ahaziah had fallen through the the lattice window of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. He's in the Samaritan palace and apparently on the roof there was some type of lattice work. He was on the roof. That was, it's a common place. Even today in the Middle East, they build these roofs, and it's kind of their, their outdoor living room in a sense. And he fell through the lattice. It was very painful. Uh, he was injured. So he sent messengers instructing them, go inquire of Baal Zebub. You ever heard that? Baal Zebub, the Lord of the Flies. Baal Baal. That's the God that they were tempted to worship in idolatry. The God of Ekron, if I will recover from this injury. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishabite, go and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and ask them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, This is what the Lord says. You will not get up from your sick bed. You will certainly die. Then Elijah left. So Elijah intercepts the messengers going to a pagan world to inquire of a demon, literally. And he says, no. Is there not not a God in Israel? Have you forgotten that? Verse 5. The messengers returned to the king who asked him, why have you come back? They replied, a man came to meet us and said, go back to the king who sent you and declare to him, this is what the Lord says. Is it not because there is no God in Israel that you're sending these men to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore, you will not get up from your sickbed. You will certainly die. And the king asked him, what sort of man came to meet you and spoke these words to you? Well, they replied, a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. You got to listen to a hairy man 
with a leather belt around his waist. By the way, reminiscent of JTB, right? John the Baptist. If you look at Scripture and you see all the links in Scripture back to itself over and over and over, over 65,000 times, the Bible refers back to itself in some way or another. As some have said, the Bible is the very first hyperlinked document ever produced. 66 different books written on many different continents by many different authors and how it all fits together like a hand in a glove. By the way, if you've been reading, this happens to you all the time, you've been reading Scripture long, all of a sudden you'll be reading something like this and you go, bam, that's back in Matthew. Or Matthew picks this same thing up. Jesus picks this same thing up. And it goes over and over and over. All through Scripture, you see these links back to itself to even have a greater interpretation of Scripture as the Bible interprets itself. So he was a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. It doesn't say he was eating locusts, but you get the picture. He said, it's Elijah the Tishabite. So the king Ahaziah sent a captain of 50 with his 50 men to Elijah. When the captain went up to him... He was sitting on the top of the hill. He announced, man of God, the king declares, come down. Now, even, even that sentence is a paradox, is it not? If he is the man of God, maybe you shouldn't command him to do what he's commanding him to do. Verse 10, Elijah responded to the captain of the 50. If I am the man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. So the king sent another captain of 50 with his 50 men to Elijah. And he took <clears throat> in the situation and announced, man of God. I love that. And he took in the situation. In other words, he still smells the smoke, right? And he still sees the body. And so he's taking in the situation thinking, uh, I don't know if I want to say this, but I'm commanded. And he, he commands him, man of God, come down. And Elijah responds to the 50, of the, the captain of the 50, if I'm the man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. So the king sent another captain of 50 with him, with 50 men to Elijah. He took in the situation and he announced, man of God, this is what the king says, come down immediately. This is the second guy, come down immediately. Elijah responded, if I am the man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and the 50 men. So a divine fire came down from heaven and consumed the 50 men. Then the king sent the third captain of the 50 with 50 men. The third captain of 50 went up and fell on his knees. A different posture, right? Complete different approach. And he kneels in front of Elijah and he begs him, man of God, please, let my life and the lives of the 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Already fire has come down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of 50 men, uh, the captain of 50 with their 50 men. But this time, let my life be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him. Don't be afraid of him. So he got up, went down with him to the king. Then Elijah said to King uh, Ahaziah, this is what the Lord has said. Because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, it is because is it because there is no god in Israel? It's the same word. Nothing changed. It's the same word. It is, is it because there is no god in Israel for you to inquire of his will? You will not <clears throat> get up from the sickbed. You will certainly die. And Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord that Elijah had spoken. Since he had no son, Joram became king in his place. This happened in the second year of Judah's king, uh, Jehoram's son of Jehoshaphat. The rest of the events of Ahaziah's reign, along with his accomplishments, are written among in, his, uh, in, in the historical records of, king, of the Israel's kings. Chapter 2, verse 1. The time had come for the Lord to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elijah and Elisha, two, in, two individuals, Elijah is the elder, Elisha is the new prophet. They were traveling to Gilgal. And Elijah, the senior, said to Elisha, the junior, Stay here. The Lord is sending me on to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Then the sons of the prophet 
who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know. Be quiet. In other words, just shut up. I know this. He's already know this. It's just bad news. I don't want it to happen. Quit saying that. Verse 4, Elijah, sent, Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here. The Lord is sending me to Jericho. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourselves live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. Then the sons of the prophet who were in Jericho came up to Elisha and said, do you know today that the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, I know. Be quiet. Elijah said to him, stay here. And the Lord is sending me to Jordan. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourselves lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men from the sons of the prophet, verse 7, came and he stood facing them from a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, that's his robe in a sense, took his mantle, rolled it up and struck the water which parted to the right and the left. Then the two of them crossed over on dry land. After they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me, what can I do for you before I'm taken away from you? So Elisha answered, listen to this, please. Let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. What an incredible request. And Elijah replied, you have asked for something very difficult. If you see me being taken from you, you will have it. If not, you won't. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire with horses of fire suddenly appeared and separated the two of them. Then Elijah went up into heaven in the whirlwind. As Elisha, that's the younger, watched, he kept crying out, My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. Notice he referred to Elijah as the chariot and the horsemen of Israel. Then he never saw Elisha again. He took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two and into pieces. And Elisha picked up the mantle that had fallen off Elijah and went back and he stood on the banks of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle off of Elijah that he uh, had dropped and he struck the water. There the Lord God of, of Elijah. Now, where is the Lord God of Elijah, he asked. He struck the water himself and they parted to the right and to the left. He did the exact same miracle that Elijah did. Elisha was following in his footsteps at this river. When the sons of the prophet from Jericho who were facing him, saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah has rested on Elisha. They came to meet him and they bowed down to the ground in front of him. Then the sons of the prophet said to Elijah, since there are 50 strong men here with your servants, please let us go and search for your master. Maybe the spirit of the Lord has carried him away and put him on one of the mountains or into one of the valleys. In other words, since he's not dead, he may still be here. He may still be around. In other words... <laughs> How could it be that in the passing of these patriarchs, in the passing of this prophet, that we could still make it without this one man? So they were still baffled. So he answered, don't send them. However, they urged him to the point of embarrassment. So he said, send them. And they sent the 50 men who looked for three days, but they did not find him. When they returned to him in Jericho, where he was staying, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? In other words, you just wasted your time. Verse 19, then the man of the city said to Elisha, even though our Lord can see that this city's location is good, the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful, he replied, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. After they had brought him one, Elisha went out to the springs of the water, threw salt in it, and said, this is what the Lord says, I have healed this water. No longer will death or unfruitfulness rest in it. Therefore, the water remains healthy to this very day, according to the word of Elisha, had spoken. Then, this is, here's, that was the third miracle. Here's the fourth. Watch this one. I'm sorry, that was the second. Here's the third. For there, Elisha went up to Bethel. And as he was walking up there, uh, small boys, junior high boys, it got to be. <laughs> small boys came out of the city and harassed him, chanting, Go up, Baldy, go up, Baldy, making fun of him. This is preacher's favorite story in the Bible, <laughs> making fun of the preacher. Not really. So he turned around, he looked at them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and mauled them. Now, it doesn't say that 
the bears killed him, just as he mauled him. Okay? It could have been killing, but I like to think he just put some scratches on him. See? From there, Elijah went to Mount Carmel, and then he returned to Samaria. What an incredible story of the changing of the prophets, the passing of a patriarch, and the voice of the Lord. And what we see in this incredible passage before us, we see a reaction to the Word of God, to a reaction to the righteousness of God, a reaction to the, the power of God or the Spirit of God. And then we see a reaction to the people of God, a certain posture that you and I should maintain. In this passage of Scripture, we see be- at the very beginning a incorrect or a bad posture towards the Word of God. You and I are very familiar with the Bible. We know that the Bible is the very voice of God. We are told in 2 Timothy 3.16 that it is the Word of God, it is Scripture, that is the very breath of God. In order to talk, you must throw breath across your vocal cords, and the breath of an individual was the word of an individual. The Bible is very clear of the position of the Word of God, and that God puts His Word above His name. God puts the Word of God as high and lifted up. It is His Word, it's His character, it's His bond, it's His promise, it's His very nature, it reflects His very nature. The Word of God has a position that's very, very high. There is no question about the stability of the Word of God. You and I know the miracle that is right there in your lap, a pure miracle, 66 different books, very, very few books, you could list them in a small little sentence, have existed as long as these books have existed. In fact, most books that were written on the type of material that the Bible was written upon faded within a couple of decades and was gone. This actually, this The book, the Bible, the collection of books that make up the writings of Scripture were written on mediums that deteriorated fairly quickly. And so just the fact of what it was written on shows that God has a divine preservation for His very Word. God has this position of the Bible and His Word, and He also wants us to have the right posture before the position of Scripture. And when we have the wrong posture, the wrong attitude towards Scripture, then um, things begin to go downhill for us. We look at this one king, Ahaziah, who fell. He had an accident. And he was in, on his bed, a sick bed, as it said. These are the kinds of beds where people die. He knew enough to know that the type of injury he had He was in jeopardy of losing his own life. And it's very interesting that when people fall into calamities or when you and I are being squished and you and I are in trials and tribulation, that is where we define and we decide what our final authority is. We we decide it's when you and I are being crushed and we are being squeezed that we are looking for the final answer. It is no joke time. We need answers now. And this boy failed the test. He runs to something other than God. He's looking for another word. It's as if he wants some source that he still has a little control over. See, you can't control God. You and I can't control His Word. We don't manipulate it. We don't change it. In fact, there's a warning in Scripture that says, if you take away from or if you add to, you will be cursed. You can't change it. I can't make the Word of God say something that it doesn't say. I will never forget. I have never heard the very... Uh, audible voice of God that I know of. I haven't. But I've heard his voice much louder than that. That still small voice. And I remember really grappling with the ideas, God calling me into ministry. And one of the tests I gave myself is, you know what? God, I have nothing to say 
what right do I have to say anything? And that this un, inaudible voice, which was so loud to me, said, that's good because I've already said it. You don't need to make up nothing, right? And so an uncreative Mac roller doesn't have any ounce ability to make up anything, and neither do you compared to the creativity of God. You and I cannot speak forth the very word of God. We can repeat it, but we can't make it up. And so here's a boy, a young a, a man, a king, who is wanting to control what God says, and he goes to Beelzebub. Now, we, that name is famous to us because Jesus confronts Beelzebub, a demon spirit. And I would say this. If you go to other sources to get your direction in life, to base your moral life on, to get your comfort, if you go to anyone else but the Lord God Almighty, you may find out that you're actually talking to something or receiving something from the very dark world. I don't know how many people have been led into the occult by just playing little games of, of the Ouija board or little seance games they play by themselves. And then they get surprised when they hear an answer. Or they go to social media and they do all these polls or they talk to their friends or they ask someone that doesn't know anything about Scripture and they take a negative posture towards Scripture and they take a positive posture to any voice that says what they want to hear. Be careful when your ears are itching and you find someone to scratch it. When you're plotting out in a course... And the counsel you get from people is no, no, and you keep going until you finally hear a yes to do what you want to do. And it is a major, major problem. Look, the all, all reality, the fact that you and I have the Bible right in front of us is a miracle. The many have tried to extinguish the Bible. Did you know that? You know that, right? Decade after decade after decade, even right even after, after Jeremiah wrote Jeremiah, a, a, Jew, a, a king of Israel came and destroyed the book. And Jeremiah says, that's not fair. And God says, write it again. And he wrote it again. And right before uh, the, the, uh, the great turn of the century, right before uh, Jesus is born, someone tried to get rid of all the Old Testament. There was an attack on the Word of God. There was a group of people uh, named the Essene who took all the text they could, and they took it and they hid it down in Qumran, right? Now, they didn't get rid of all the texts that were out there, but they were waiting for a great war, and they preserved it. Hundreds of years before Christ, they had the book of Daniel there, right? Several hundred years, they were collecting and sticking them in caves. And then in the 40s, some little boy discovered this cave by throwing a rock in a hole, and all of a sudden he heard a smash, and he crawls up in that hole, and they find these clay tablets, the, the perfect humidity to maintain these rare scrolls. And when you take those scrolls dating 1,500 years before our latest scroll that we thought we had was our earliest, and you compare the two, and they are identical. I'm talking about a divine preservation of the Word of God. People have been attacking it. After the resurrection of Christ, you had the Diocletian persecution. He was a Roman leader. And this Roman leader sent his whole army after the Word of God to destroy it, but he couldn't do it. In fact, the very next king was Constantine. And Constantine preserved the Word of God and, and then had it translated many, many times. And then you move on in the Dark Ages, and there were those that any time the Bible was written in English or, or a language that people could read, the official church, the Catholic church, killed them. They killed Tyndale. They killed Wycliffe. And they hated them for translating the Bible in their own language because if you can control what people read, you can control people, right? And so here's a boy, here's a man, here's a king who says, I don't like what I'm reading. He sends a delegation out to inquire of Beelzebub, and then they are intercepted by the man of God and says this, is there not a God in Israel? Is there not a God in Israel? Brother and sister, let me ask you this question. Do you and I not have the very voice of God in front of us? Do we not? I mean, this is our source. It's the word of God. It's not church tradition, although I love our church tradition. 
but our church tradition isn't authoritative. It's not our preachers. It's not our, our teachers. Unless they're teaching and rightly dividing the word of truth, then it is. The most powerful experience you can have is when you are alone with being attended by the Holy Spirit who will bring all truth to you and you are opening up the Word of God and you are saying, there is a God in San Angelo <laughs> and His name is Yahweh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He speaks and I get to open up His very Word and read it for myself and He begins to do surgery upon your heart and encouragement upon your heart and we read it for ourselves. For, for someone to go anywhere else, for any other direction in life, in morals, in values, in this whole spirit of adoption, looking for love in all the wrong places, and yet you go to God, and He shows you this love. There's nothing more powerful in your life than for God speaking to you directly. Let me ask you this question. What is your posture towards the Word of God? Do you take it for granted? I was talking to a young man. He was from Africa uh, about 10 days ago, and he was saying to me, uh, while he was of a certain religion. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't, why don't you just talk to God on your own? Why don't you do that? He was a waiter. Why don't you just talk to God on your own? And he says, I don't know how. I said, I can teach you real quick. And I said, have you ever thought about reading the Bible? And he says this, but I can't interpret the Bible for myself. Someone else has to do that. And my heart was like, oh, oh, you've been deceived. Do you know that all you need to do is open up the Word of God? And he said, I don't know if I understand it. Well, how about this? Do you understand where it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength? Do you understand that? Yeah, I understand that. Then do that. Do you understand where it says, love your neighbor as yourself? Do you understand that? Yeah, I understand that. See, you've already just digested some of the most important doctrines within Scripture. And it gets even better as you begin to read. Sure, you need to understand context. Sure, you need to have an open heart. Sure, it's, you need to know some history of Scripture. But you can read it for yourself. In fact, you've heard me say this before. I think the, someone told me this, and I believe it. The definition of preaching is teaching people how to read the Bible on their own. That's the whole goal right here. And if you coming to Glen Meadows, you have more of a desire to dig into the Word of God than you've ever had, then, then we as Glen Meadows, in our teachers, our life groups, our Sunday school, we have done our job to get you alone with the Lord and His Word and for it just to sweep over you and to be changed. Let me ask you, are you looking for another source? Are you looking for ultimate truth in any other place? Or are we, are we applying the Word of God to ourselves? This guy didn't. He didn't like it. He ran on to someone else. And I will tell you, he didn't like what he was going to read from the Word of God. So he went searching for something that would match his own desires. And I'm telling you, you are on thin ice, brother and sister, when you began to look to other sources to affirm what you want to believe or to encourage you to do whatever you just want to do. The Word of God is very, very powerful. You know what? He may send you... A hairy man with a leather belt. <laughs> and that is not a good thing. <laughs> the hairy man with a leather belt. Next. You need to have a proper posture to the righteousness of God. A proper posture to the righteousness of God. God, by definition, is God. We, by definition, are not. God is holy. He's good. It's His mercy and His love that chase after us. Surely goodness and mercy will pursue you all the days of your life. And not only is God benevolent, loving, and caring, but He's also right and He's righteous in all that He does, in all that He is. And what we see here is because this king didn't like what God was going to say, he wanted to kill the messenger. He wanted to kill Elijah. Make no mistake, he was sending the captain of 50 men and his 50 to go get Elijah, and he was going to kill him. And so when this man came and his 50 men, and he said, come down, man of God. He said, listen, if I'm a man of God, may fire come down. And guess what? Boom, toast, instantly, 
He was, they were fried there. I, I don't know uh, the, the medium by which it came. Was it lightning? Was it just a ball of fire? Did they just spontaneously combust? The answer is yes, all of those things. Smoke, stench. I mean, even Elijah probably said, wow, I didn't know that was going to happen so quick. And by the way, I need a mask. Just burnt. <laughs> then a second. It happened again. Then if I am representing the Lord, may fire come down, and fire did. Let me, let me bring up something that's kind of interesting. Once again, we talk about the hyperlinking of Scripture, how they have different points. You go into the New Testament, Luke chapter 9, I believe it is, and they were in Samaria, and they were rejected, Jesus and the disciples. And the disciples were really, really mad. And they're like this, should I, one of them said, should I call down fire from heaven so that it would consume them? Remember that? In other words, they were probably in this region, and they were probably reading their Old Testament, and they're thinking, Jesus, should I do this? I mean, I would love to do this right now. I'd love to smoke them. And Jesus rebukes them and says this, listen, we're in a different time. We're in a whole new administration. I didn't come to bring judgment, but I came to bring salvation. Do you see the switch? You go from a monotheistic where God is keeping people in control to where now as Israel and the revelation has progressed and the story has moved on and they've come to the conclusion that Israel basically doesn't exist as a, as a government at this point. And he's saying, now you all probably understand that I'm trying to bring internal change because you can't bring change externally. You were wanting a king. You were wanting to rule on your own. And I told you, this is not going to work, but you wanted to do it anyway. Now, have I proved my point? And then God was giving grace, and he was applying the truth of mercy at this moment. And so I just wanted, just wanted to bring that out so you could see the connection between the Testaments and the big, big story of the whole Scripture and where we are in this. And then the third leader of 50, he brings his 50 men, and he has a different posture, doesn't he? And he literally begs, and he, he is basically pleading for his life. Already fire has come down from heaven to consume the first two. And the angel of the Lord, when he says, listen, I, he kneels before Elijah. He has the proper posture to God's righteousness. And this, this literally goes right alongside with God's sovereignty. God's, God's in control. And you and I have a posture within our heart that, Lord, I see the evil that's going on. I see the bad. And there are things in my own life, Lord, I want you to change. Nonetheless, I bow down my knee to you. And this is a tough lesson. It's, 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 while, it's why you and I go through trials and tribulations. So that we begin to learn that God is in control and I am not. And no matter what happens to me... <laughs> Though you slay me, yet will I serve you. God, I have a posture towards your righteousness where my knee is bent. My heart is yours. Do with me whatever you want. Here is a man, a captain of 50, that learned from the other two wayward guys. He got on his knees and he said, listen, because he knew uh, his king made him go there. He didn't want to be there. But he's in front of Elijah representing the Lord and says, I bow my knee to you. You can take my life at any moment. But I'm asking you to spare my life, and I'll do whatever you say. What an unbelievable posture to have towards the righteousness of God. It's probably one of the things that, uh, one of the realities that cause people to run from the Lord or to run to the world. It, it has to do with lordship. He's either in control, I either surrender to him or I don't. I see him high and lifted up and worthy of my obedience, or I don't. And where God wants obedience, he wants it all the time, but he also wants it when things are scary. When, when, when you need to speak up, but you're afraid to. When, when things are very difficult, or, or, or there's life on the line, or there's tragedy or sadness, and we want to run the other way, or we get bitter towards God. Let me tell you something. There's no need to ever be bitter towards God. God already loves you. He has your best in mind. He sent his son to die for you and for me so that we can have life everlasting. And once you receive life everlasting, what else do you want? 
He has a place for you in heaven. Jesus prepares the hearts of the disciples before they go through great tribulation. He said, believe in God, believe also in me, and in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And now I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way. And Thomas says, uh, I don't, I think, I don't know the way, Lord. He said, yes, you know the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Listen, listen to me. Jesus is saying this. I know things can get really, really bad, and it's fixing to in just a couple hours. That's what Jesus is alluding to. But listen, I've got a place for you, and it's going to be okay. Did you know that our posture towards the righteousness of God is motivated primarily that he has everything wrapped up for all eternity? He has, for the believer, for those that trust Jesus, Lord and Savior, he's got you, and it is fantastic. One moment in heaven is worth thousands of lifetimes, amen? His presence, the place. Can you imagine living life without any anxiety or worry or concern at all? Is anybody worried today? I was worried about that. <laughs> that there would be people who are worrying. I'm one of those guys. I'm concerned about those things. Can you imagine? Have you, I mean, since most of us are grown-ups, I mean, some of us are in grown-up bodies, but we're not grown-up, but remember when we were young and we would play and we would be so involved in whatever we were doing that it literally suspended time and you didn't worry about anything and you just carried on? That's kind of what it's like to be in heaven and much, much more. But it has to do, so, so you and I can bow can bow down to the righteousness of God, that he has it all under control and completely in control. But I also want you to look at, literally, a right posture towards the Spirit of God or the power of God. The right posture. And we see here that Elisha had seen God work through Elijah in, in many events, in many times. He saw him defeat the prophets of Baal. He saw him do many, many signs and wonders. In fact, it's interesting uh, that, that most of the things that Elijah did, he did in the mountainside. It's just interesting. When I was looking at all of the, the acts or the supernatural events that took place around Elijah, it all took place in the high places. And that's where all the spiritual in, uh, confrontations were with, with, uh, with paganism. And then Elijah says this, look, if you're going to go... <laughs> If you're going to go, uh, please give me a double portion of your spirit and put it on me. And Elijah replied, you've asked for something very, very difficult. Here's what we get from this. It is a good thing to desire the things of the spirit. It's a good thing. The Bible says if anybody desires to be an elder, you desire a good thing, meaning in the church, you desire a good thing. If anybody desires to serve the Lord with all your heart, you desire a good thing. If anybody desires to see, uh, to see God work among, amongst you with signs and wonders, you desire a good thing. It's always good. In fact, I think it's very healthy for a Christian to be bent and leaning towards the supernatural. Does that make sense? Instead of just constantly saying, you know, okay, Sarah, Sarah, whatever will be, will be. Does anybody even know who Doris Day is? Okay, okay. I'm in the right crowd. I'm in the right crowd. <clears throat> the next two services, I'm sorry. They won't get it. They're just... Um, Christians should be humble, but I don't know if we need to put up with everything. With the stations in life and with the things that we go through, I think that there is a, a posture that we have that we really want to see change that we desire for God to do things among us, and catch this, and to do things through us. If you desire to be used by God, you desire a good thing. If you desire for God to do things that are unusual through you, then it puts you and me in a very sensitive posture to want the Lord to work through us. 
And God answered that prayer. Elijah said this. He said, you know what? If I'm caught up with, uh, out of here, then that means that God's going to do it. And, uh, and it, it was a very optimistic situation, very hopeful. And Elijah was taken up. And Elijah, Elisha knew at that moment that he would have a double portion. And immediately he, he performed the miracles that Elijah had just done. He changed water. That which was bitter became useful. And that's not just, it did happen exactly like that, but it's it's, it's a metaphor also that all the things that are bitter, God is going to use him to make it useful. And so then Elisha goes on to do twice as many miracles as Elijah did. It's just documented, one after another after another. And it started off with a request, a desire. Let me ask you this. Do you desire these things? Glenn Meadows, do we desire to be supernatural to where we see we're able to give God the glory for whatever happens? And who was it? William Carey that said this, the great missionary that said, you should attempt great things from God and you should expect great things from God. And so you individually, personally, having been born again by the regeneration of the word and you've been filled with the holy spirit and you you have the gifts of the spirit and the fruit of the spirit and now god sets us apart to where we are part of a body we are the priesthood of the believers and he has a, he has a great commission it's not just any commission it is a great commission and it is eternal has eternal value and brothers and sisters what god lights and what he sets on fire is, is a blaze that needs to blaze not only through our congregation to where sleeping Christians wake up, to where we see the movement of God, we see what God sees in this world, and we even transcend above the normal problems. We aren't drugged down because of we hear this or we hear that. We drop to our knees and we get involved in supernatural warfare because of what God wants us to do. Let me ask you this. Do you desire to be used spiritually and to have a double portion of what you've already got, whatever that means, to seeing God work powerfully. And Elijah says this, um, that's a difficult thing. That's a loaded statement. Because the power of God in your life, this is the way I interpret it, comes with sacrifice. In fact, In in most cases, the reason that Christians aren't powerful with the Word of God, they're not powerful in their testimony, they're not powerful in their countenance, they're not powerful in their prayer, is because it's very costly. It's, it's, It's the sacrificial life. It's the life where you say, Jesus is Lord. And it is our religious, quote, duty, or our spiritual duty, that we are to die to self. Self-ambition, self-promotion, selfishness, and it's a difficult thing. It's not an easy thing, but it's a, it's a price worth paying. It's a price worth paying. It's a price worth paying. And what price has God asked you and me to pay in order for the Lord to work powerfully in our life? It, it, it's the ultimate price. It's, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. It's dying to self. It's picking up your cross. It's it's by the mercies of God that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto Him, which is our religious service, which is our reasonable service. And then we know the will of God by the renewing of our mind, proving God's plan is perfect. So just like Jesus, who humbled Himself, emptied Himself of and, and, and became a baby, and, and he lived, and he grew in wisdom and stature. And he lived a perfect life, and it was sacrificial. But then God exalted him to the right hand of the Father, to where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Let me ask you this question. Do you really want to see a double portion? I think, I think, I think the answer is yes all around the room. Now, God will continue to lead you to difficult things. Some of you are going to start waking up earlier, spending time with the Lord. You're going to start journaling. You're going to do the hard work of just reading Scripture. And we call it hard work. It might start off to be hard at first, but then it just becomes so exuberating. 
You, you might, and, and here's some of the hard work. The hard work is you're, you're meeting with the Lord, and the Lord starts altering your heart, and all of a sudden you go, oh, no. I, I need to go back, and I need to ask someone to forgive me of a bad attitude. I mean, they deserved it. No, no. But, but God, forgive me of that bad attitude. And you start, those are the hard things to do. And, and you, stay, you stay in the fight, but not only that. You have the right posture towards the people of God. Now, these, these little boys, these junior high boys were making fun of Elijah. And, and I would like to say that you need to have the right posture towards your preacher and only say nice things. <laughs> but that would be a little self-serving. And you're saying, look, I ain't seen a bear in St. Angela in a long time, you goofy little preacher. <laughs> I think there is a right posture, if I can take anything out of this, to what God is doing in our midst and just recognizing it. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are to have the right posture towards one another. We are to honor the body, to love one another. Now, we all have differences. We all have many differences. But in the midst of our differences, we are to have charity. We are to, we are to know what really matters most. We are to have this proper perspective that we are literally willing to put the needs of everybody else in this room and in our church above our own needs. I mean, we are, we, are to, we are to demonstrate that in many different ways, where you park at church, how, what you bring someone when they're sick to eat or drink, what the, the, way you, the way you encourage one another, the way you prefer one another, the way you give sacrificially to Glen Meadows. It, it goes to others. It goes to making ministry function very, very well. It's, it's the way my wife and I, we defer to you as we give sacrificially, as you give sacrificially. We give. It's, it's how we give of our talents. It's, it's when we find ourselves in the most inconvenient places, doing the most inconvenient things, like serving hot dogs to VB, 700 BBS kids. It's just crazy. And, and you all came out and did it. Many, if not all of you, would have done it had you, could, had you had the opportunity. And so it's, it's, it's having the proper posture towards these things and towards these, all that God is doing around us. But God's word is, is worth having the right posture. It's acknowledging what God has done through his word. It's acknowledging what God wants to do to me through his word. It's having the right posture towards righteousness. It's having the right posture towards the moving of the Holy Spirit. It's having the right posture towards one another. And when you look at this whole passage, you end up saying this. You say, here's a man who didn't believe God exists. And he went to seek another God. And we think that in our land, and there's a lot of truth to this, that there's a problem because we have leaders in our land, politicians, that, act, that, that say that God doesn't exist. From the schoolhouse and even in the church house, and even in the political house, they're saying that God doesn't exist. Let me tell you what the real problem is. It's not just from all of our leaders that say that God doesn't exist. The real problem is all the Christians that act like God doesn't exist. That's the real problem. And when you act like God exists, then you literally have the proper posture towards the Word of God. Because God exists. You have the proper posture towards the righteousness of God because God exists. You have the right posture towards supernatural power because God exists. And you have the right posture towards one another because God exists. And let's live like God exists. 